Hello family, welcome back. I'm very glad that you all enjoyed the drone footage and I'm very excited to share the more drone footage to come. Um, but yeah, I've been delayed for a week, but very gladly because we have Mr. Joe Kaufman here and he is a very fascinating man. He's been traveling all around the world and he'll tell you a bit about his own journey. But first of all, I want to ask you how you found Master Goose Place. Uh, I found Master Goose Place through George Thompson here. <laughs> so he's the very first person who, from the channel, has come here. So I think this is worth marking as an occasion of yeah, the DAO being spread throughout the world via the internet. So that's awesome. So what's your trip? Tell us about it. Where have you been and what, what's the idea been? Um, well, so I've been reading a lot for a few years about different cultures, different traditions from different cultures and trying to find out what it is that they're teaching and... I, I feel like there's an underlying truth to all of these cultures, even though they have different traditions. So I wanted to find out what this common truth was, and I started doing that through books, started reading a lot about it. Um, but it just, you know, there's a limit to that. So I really just wanted to experience for myself what these different cultures were and what they had to offer. And so, yeah, so at first... Um, <laughs> I had to find out how to do that, so I saved up money for quite a while and um, started off at home because in, in America there's a lot of native communities and so I live in the Northwest, there's a lot of native American people there and also I, I wanted to make it more than just my own thing so I thought other people could benefit from it too so maybe I should record it and so I, I interviewed the first person and just the things that he were telling me was telling me was just so incredible, so um, valuable that I really saw it was it could be something useful, and so I just started. Can you give an example of the Native American ideas or one of them? Yeah, well, they have a really simple philosophy. It's like, like basically like <laughs> Father Sky, Mother Earth, brother and sister. Like mm. it's that basic. Um, not to say that that gets rid of any depth that it has, but it's very simple, um, that we're all one with the great spirit so, or the creator, or whatever name they give it, give to it. And so they see everyone as family. Uh, they see the animals as family. They see you as family. Um, plants they see as family. Everything has a spirit to it. Everything is part of this great spirit. Mm -hmm. And by recognizing that spirit in you and in, in you and all of us, we, we're all part of something greater. Mm. And so I thought that was really, really beautiful. But basically, the natives have um, a way of greeting each other. And I don't really know how to pronounce it, but it basically just means all my relations. So when they l connect with someone, mm. they say, like, all my relations, like, they just re realize the relation. Mm. You know, so they're saying hello to one person, but they realize the connection of the greater whole. Yeah, yeah. So they just have a very holistic way of looking at things. Mm. So I thought that was really beautiful. Mm. Um, and did the, you have a greater idea of the whole project from that first point or did that trigger like this has been matching everything that I've been reading so far and then you kind of extended your reach? Well, it started out as like a personal thing. Like mm. I wanted to, for myself, I wanted to learn, you know, what these different cultures had to teach and what was the common truth so that I could understand it. Mm. Um, but yeah, after the first interview, I, I was like so many people could benefit from mm. from this mm. and so it became more of like a, a a vision and I was like I'm still piecing it together I don't really have um I just have a general idea is I think I think the problem in the world is I mean there's so many problems in the world if we look at just the external forms you know there's like famine there's poverty there's war there's just violence and all these forms but I think what's at the root of them is something simple. It's just a simple problem, but it's on such a mass scale mm. that, that we're creating all of these, these different ways of the problem is manifesting. Mm. So I think the main problem is that we have a case of mistaken identity. Mm. It's like we, we've identified with uh, our body, we've identified with our culture, identify with our skin color, mm. identify with our thoughts, mm. identify with our memory, our social image all of these things that we identify with as if that's who we really are. Mm. But in truth, we're, our real identity is the whole of nature mm. or 
the, the great spirit or however you want to call it. Mm. Our, our identity is something that we're all a part of. Mm. And so by misperceiving ourselves to be these isolated, separate human beings, then we create these barriers around ourselves out of fear because if, if everything's separate from me, then you know naturally I'm afraid of everything and I want to protect myself from everything. So I create these barriers and then that makes it hard for me to open up, hard for me to express myself, uh, hard for me to relate to people. And it's, it just creates this strange wall mm. and we're, we start to feel captivated and trapped inside. Mm. And that all stems from this, this one belief that we're mm. separate. Mm. And so I think if people realize that we're connected to everybody and everyone is, is a part of ourself, then how can I have hatred for somebody who's myself? Mm. You know, mm. how can I be afraid of somebody who's myself? Or how can I be sad when I lose something to know that it's just going to come back in another mm. way? Mm. And we were discussing kind of like the nature of absolute evil and absolute good and how people take the cases of famine and natural disasters and then take this to the logical conclusion that nature is evil and out to get us. But it's just like the fact that you ignore all this, the fact that you cannot define as being separate from the environment because we rely on sunlight for crops and vitamin D and, and mm-hmm. you know, everything is connected. And yet it's, yeah, it seems such a fundamental misconception that we are kind of separate from that greater whole. Yeah, yeah there's a, a Buddhist philosophy or concept called shunyata which means emptiness Mm. and there's two different ways of looking at that philosophy and the first one is that nothing has any intrinsic qualities or value to it but that we project those qualities onto things Mm. so um, let's see a good example I could look at a flower and I could say like wow that flower is beautiful but that's just it might be beautiful but that's just the quality I'm giving to it. It's not inherently beautiful. And so we do that with a lot of things, you know, like, mm. oh, that person's evil, that person's good. But to other other people, you know, that's like their brother and they love them or that's whatever. We, we all have different views on things. Mm. So the thing itself doesn't have any quality that's like permanent. Mm. It's just uh, we're all interpreting the world in our own ways, mm. which kind of goes back to that idea, you know, of think, looking through this lens of separation is we're interpreting everything as if it's against us and we're this victim. Mm, and mm. so it's creating violence and creating separation and fear and all of these things. Mm. And then the other aspect of the Shunyata philosophy is that um, nothing has any inherent existence in itself either, like a, a flower or a tree is a good example. We look at something called tree and we've given it that label tree, mm. but you know, we also, there's roots to the tree, there's branches to the tree, there's leaves to the tree. Mm. The tree is connected to the soil, to the rain, to the sun. Um, everything is a part of this tree, this mm. separate thing yeah. in our minds. So you can break everything down that way. And really everything's a part of this one being, this one holistic mm. organism. Mm. So where did you start <laughs> or continue exploring Buddhism? <laughs> Green tea, <bang> and white. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know. It's been like gradual. Like at first, I would go to like workshops or go to like there's a a local, somewhat local Rinpoche, which is like a reincarnated Lama, hmm. and he lives in uh, Woodby Island, which is close to where I live. So sometimes he comes to Seattle, has workshops that I'd go to. Um, I've done a few Vipassana retreats, which are meditation retreats where you just have total silence, meditate for 10, 10 days, like about 10 hours a day. Um, I've done a lot of reading on Zen. I really like Alan Watts. Um, and then I went to Nepal and in Nepal I did a, a course on Tibetan Buddhism. And so yeah, I was learning a lot about it there. But Buddhism, Buddhism has so many different branches of Buddhism, like even Tibetan Buddhism has four different branches. And aside from just Tibetan Buddhism, you know, there's Zen, there's um, Theravada, which is like the Southeast Asian, and they all have different doctrines and different practices they follow. The Buddha, whenever people would ask him about God, or is there a spirit, is there God, he would always just say, I teach only suffering and the elimination of suffering or the liberation from suffering. Mm. So he would try to avoid these metaphysical okay, concepts. Interesting. But 
he talked about something called nirvana. Mm. Nirvana is um, when once someone is enlightened, they've realized nirvana. And so he had this deep understanding of reality where he realized that things like we suffer because of our concepts, essentially, like concepts of good or bad, concepts of myself and others, concept of birth, death. And so he wanted to free people from concepts. And when they're free from concepts, they see reality as it is in its suchness or is a Buddhist term. Mm. And I, so I think he wanted to point people to a direct experience of the oneness of things instead of a concept of it because you can just just as easily identify with a concept as you can or a concept of oneness as you can with a concept of separation but to add on to this my my interest was in Dzogchen which is a form of Tibetan Buddhism and Dzogchen or it actually comes from the Nyingma tradition is mm. the tradition but Dzogchen is a teaching that um Basically, they say that our true nature is um, there's naked awareness, like pristine, pure, naked awareness, just ever present, completely perfect as it is. Like Zogchen, I think, can be translated as the great perfection. Mm. So basically, who we are in our natural state is perfectly peaceful, perfectly calm, perfectly whole. And everyone has this true nature in them, the same peaceful natural state. And if we realize that state, then basically everything else is taken care of. Like different branches of Buddhism say you have to, you know, follow the sutras exactly. You have to take the precepts. You have to do all these rules. And in Dzogchen, they just say, if you just, you know, realize your natural state, everything exists in the natural state already. And so you will just naturally be compassionate. You'll naturally not want to steal and naturally not want to kill. And so a lot of branches of Buddhism actually go, don't really agree with that branch, but I find it fascinating because they, they point to what a lot of other um, traditions point to, is that who we are at our core is already complete in itself. Like We don't have to do anything to, to become one. We, we already are. Mm. So I really like that idea. Mm. And so just briefly, just cover the other locations that you went to, and I'm guessing that they all kind of said similar things. Yeah, so I went to Guatemala, and when I was in Guatemala, um, I was, I did a few ceremonies with a Mayan priest or a Mayan spiritual guide, and they have a philosophy called In La Kesh, which means like I am another you, or you are another me, you are another myself. I think is the translation. So there again, they they when they look at somebody, they see them themselves. They're just mirrors. Like you know, I'm looking at you. And inside of you, I see myself. And if you're looking at me, hopefully you see yourself. We're just conscious beings, you know, human beings. We, we all live our lives. We all have the same problems to deal with, the same emotions, same struggles. And that spirit within us is, is the same. I mean, we're, we're different people, but at our essence, you know, we're one. And so in the Mayan teachings, they, they recognize that. Mm. And... Uh, I went to Peru, and Peru is a very shamanic culture, many shamanic cultures. Um, so I stayed with, um, I was doing some ayahuasca ceremonies with uh, the Shipibo tribe, and there's a huge language barrier for me speaking to them. So I, I pretty much just experienced with them, like they have this huge connection to nature, an incredible knowledge of the plant world. The, they don't have any human teachers really. The, the plants themselves are their teachers. Mm. Um, and so they have the maestros or the masters are just people that have really learned how to communicate with the plants. But I mean, more than any tradition, they have like this completely direct experience of being connected to nature. Mm. And then there's the uh, Quechua people. From, they live in the mountains of Peru and they too have an amazing connection to the land and to the spirit in the land. But when I spoke to um, uh, Maestro Juan Gabriel, he's like this just adorable elderly man, <laughs> a really funny guy. He, I was asking about, about the spirit and if there is a great spirit. And he's like, he's like, yeah, of course, of course there is. But people focus too much on, on just the spirit the father and what about the mother you know what about the mountains and the birds and the rivers and people have forgotten about that too mm. and so they really emphasize you know our connection to the land not so mm. much our connection to the spirit 
and I think Taoism does a similar thing. You know, it's there's a yin and yang balance, the earth and the heaven. You don't want to go to any extreme, mm. but realize they're two parts of a, a greater whole. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and after Peru, I went to India, and India's known to be like the um, the dom I don't know dominant or the like what would you say like super super center of spirituality hmm. you know a lot of spiritual teachings originated in India and spread east or west the the true self is Atman it's like our true soul is Atman hmm. and Atman is Brahman hmm. so our soul is the spirit hmm. and their whole like creation story is that from the uh, you can't really say from the beginning because it's like beyond time there's just always been this spirit and it decided to create um to have something to experience and to do so it had to like it, it could only create it from itself from its own potential and so it, it like forgets itself in the world in order to find itself again hmm. so it's like their whole philosophy is that you are brahman i am brahman and this whole thing is just brahman having a play with himself mm. like forgetting himself in the world just to go through all these crazy dramas of life to you know suffer to have joy to bliss the, this whole experience just to realize that it was all himself in the end mm. Mm. fascinating it is yeah so then you went to nepal for the monastery and then you've come here so yeah yeah how are you <laughs> gonna bring all those together like these ideas what, what are you planning with this project well I've also interviewed a quantum physicist. Mm. His name's Amit Goswami, mm. and so his he always says in his like teachings um, that consciousness is the ground of all being. That's he always says that. And I, when I asked him, is that the same as saying that like all is one or all is God? And he's like, exactly. It's exactly what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to show that each one of these separate traditions that have arisen in different parts of the world, have teachings that say we're all connected to nature, we're all connected to the cosmos, to each other, to the spirit. And then instead of it just being only a, like, a thing based on traditions or religions, having a modern scientist say the exact same thing mm. in, in a, a way using scientific language. Mm. So mm. a, a awesome. bit of East and West or yin and yang yeah. balance to that too. Great way of wrapping everything together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, documentary. I'm just going to put it on YouTube so anyone can watch it for free. Mm. Um, and I want to write a book about it too. And that's also just going to be for free. So Great. just for the knowledge for people to have. Awesome. Okay, well, it's been fascinating talking to you. And you can probably tell we've been talking a lot this whole week. Um, so it's been a pleasure having him here. And he's now going to be a member of the Tai Chi family. I think you're going to be coming back. Is that right? Yes, <laughs> tai, chi times. tai Chi Jia. Tai Chi Jia. Tai Chi Jia. Yeah, Been learning it. Chinese a bit. Too. Yeah. <laughs> good morning. How do you say that? Zhao Shang Hao. Very good. Yeah, he remembers. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, how can people get in touch? So, the documentary is going to be in a while, but in the meantime, mm. how can people find out what you're up to? So, I have two Instagrams, what I usually post to. The main one is Conscious Collective, so conscious underscore collective. And then my personal one is Joseph P. Kaufman, so K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. Brilliant. Yeah. And all those links will be in the description. Brilliant. Well, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thanks.